was known, and from you no secrets are hid. <coughs> Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Jeremiah 17, 5, 10. Thus says the Lord, Cursed are those who trust in mere mortals and make mere flesh their strength, whose hearts turn away from the Lord. They shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when relief comes. They shall live 
in the parched places of the wilderness, in an uninhabited salt land. Blessed are those who trust in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. They shall be like a tree planted by water, sending out its roots by the stream. It shall not fear when heat comes, and its leaves shall stay green. In the year of the drought, it is not anxious, and it does not cease to bear fruit. The heart is devious above all else. It is perverse. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, test the mind and search the heart to give to all according to their ways, according to the fruits of their doings. The word of the Lord. Praying as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain, and your faith has been in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified of God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have died in Christ have perished. If for this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, 
the fruit, first fruits of those who have died. The word of God. Thanks be to God. Jesus came down with the twelve apostles and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases, and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured, and all in the crowd were trying to touch him. For power came out from him, and he healed all of them. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day, and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven, for that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. It's really good to be with you all today. In Charles Dickens's novel Bleak House, there is a chapter entitled Telescopic Philanthropy. And the primary characters are going to meet a woman named Mrs. Jellybee. And as they arrive, at her front door, um, in the railing of the porch next to the door, one of her child's heads is stuck kind of in the railing. So they, it takes a while to kind of wedge him back out again. And they go inside the hall, which is darkened, and there's more kids kind of flying by, and you have to step over another one. And they thought, this is a madhouse. There can't possibly be an adult in here. But they get to the dining room, and there's Mrs. Jellybee, calm and composed, her daughter scribbling away madly as she dictates letters to her. The daughter has got ink all over her. But Mrs. Jellybee's eyes are focused not on her daughter, but far off 
almost as if it were, to Africa, where indeed she spent all of her time 24-7 thinking about how to create a colony of missionaries on the banks of the Niger River. She wasn't quite as focused, though, on the people right in front of her to care for those kids in the hall or making sure the potatoes were cooked for dinner or just to keep her envelopes out of the gravy. But I wonder instead, for us, instead of a telescopic philanthropy, how we might draw our eyes a bit nearer to our own person and persons under our care. When we consider God's invitation to mission, to evangelism during this season of Epiphany, as a form of living out our baptismal promise to preach, to proclaim the good news of God and Christ by word and example in this hurting world. What might it look like to practice resurrection closer to home? Practicing resurrection. It's a lovely turn of phrase, isn't it? I first heard it at the end of a poem by Wendell Berry. The poem was entitled Manifesto, the Mad Farmer's Liberation Front. And he gets a bit carried away at times, but his wildness is invigorating, so I wanted to share an excerpt. So friends, every day do something that doesn't compute. Love the Lord. Love the world. Work for nothing. Take all that you have and give it to the poor. Love someone who does not deserve it. Ask the questions that have no answers. Invest in the millennium. Plant sequoias. As soon as the generals and the politicos can predict the motions of your mind, lose it. Leave it as a sign to mark the false trail the way you didn't go. Be like the fox who makes more tracks than necessary, some in the wrong direction. Practice resurrection. Kind of wild, right? But no less wild than the idea of practicing resurrection, something as far as we know has only happened once to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Technically, Lazarus was resuscitated. Happy to talk about that after the service, if you'd like. <laughs> but who are we to practice resurrection? Surely we have nothing to contribute to the possibility of resurrection in our own lives and in the lives of this world. Or might we? I have a story to share about practicing resurrection. It's a story that you've helped and are helping to make possible. It's the story of St. Luke's in North Park, a church planted by All Saints Hillcrest, Hillcrest up the street at the end of the railway line in 1923 in a new suburb. A church that peaked in the 80s and 90s and, like many churches, began a slow decline when a lost boy from Sudan recently resettled, a refugee in San Diego, was looking for an Episcopal church. He actually went to St. James in La Jolla the Sunday before. They welcomed him graciously and said, uh, there is a cl church closer to where you live, and so he went to St. Luke's the next week. And after the service, knocked on the door of Father David Monsingo, they had a conversation. He said, you know, if you welcome me and my family, we'll fill this place someday. And who knows what Father David was thinking, but the words proved to be true. Over the decade that followed, St. Luke's became a majority Sudanese American congregation. It was a slow and in some ways inexorable process and those who participated in it, especially those who were part of St. Luke's before that man arrived, worked with Christ to practice resurrection. Because though, as St. Luke's became a working class congregation that could no longer pay its bills, it also became a vibrant center of Sudanese culture, bristling with kids, it was alive again. It was creating an essential space for worship and community for refugees struggling to make it in this expensive city. It was becoming a familiar place, like back home, 
where folks worshiped in Anglican churches because the British colonized and missionized South Sudan in the early 1900s, thanks to many Mrs. Jellybees, I'm sure. So St. Luke's was vibrant but struggling to pay its bills and relied on the faithful efforts of several retired priests over the following years. And then Laurel and I showed up a couple years ago. And I don't think Bishop Mathis or those many who were involved in launching the North Park Project quite realized how poised St. Luke's was already for growth, how alive it already was, how capable its existing leadership was. We had come with a different project in mind, an interest in experimenting with new forms of church that would be compelling to millennials. But quick, quickly realized that the project that we were called to was going to look different. It was going to be more about redeveloping and continuing to support growth that was already happening, happening at this church. Now we've gotten some help for that from the diocese, from you all. The cathedral has made significant financial contributions to us, and we're on a five-year process to uh, hopefully um, stumble upon financial sustainability. Um, our attendance is nearly doubled to 120, and pledges have more than doubled to nearly $100,000, which is exciting. But more work to go still. And our job gets to be every day to invite folks into practicing resurrection in this increasingly fancy piece of real estate two blocks south of the heart of North Park. City Heights high school students now grow and sell chard in the vacant lot next to our church. Refugee women are soon to move into a newly, newly renovated commercial kitchen in our basement for a job training program. Our homeless neighbors find a safe and welcoming place to rest, to use a computer, to get their mail in our courtyard through Uptown Community Services Center. A Nazarene church that shares our sanctuary space with us brought in a beautiful new sound system, built a serious playground for us. And the, our dream that we have of making our parish hall into a space cool enough for North Park hipsters is soon coming to reality, along with a larger dream to eventually open a restaurant with a sliding scale payment system so that all people can dine with dignity together, all people can encounter Christ in a slice of the kingdom of God in this place and time. God is good. This is what resurrection looks like. Thank you again for helping to make it possible. On Easter morning last year, I felt called to challenge our congregation to make alive, to make real the words read in that beautiful book about resurrection because one of our founding Congolese uh, refugee families, and there's been more Congolese refugees coming to St. Luke's now too, um, was being evicted. And they weren't going to have enough money for a new security deposit or weren't going to pass the income guidelines to find a place anywhere near uh, where they were currently living. But just after that service, we, we brought together folks and in minutes had found ways to cobble together a security deposit. Two people were willing to co-sign on the lease agreement. Others volunteered to help find a new place for them and others still to help clean up their old place. It is hard work. It took weeks. We did get them moved in to a new place pretty close by with an extra bedroom too, which is great. It's an ongoing work. Then we, we uh, actually had to take the landlord to small claims court because they didn't get much of their security deposit back. It is hard work. But it is good work. It is God's work. It is the work of the kingdom that is unfurling and presenting itself to this hurting world as good, good news. Jesus presents to us in today's gospel a vision of an upside-down world in which the tearful know joy, the hungry are fed, and the poor are given the keys to the kingdom. Indeed, it is an inverted reality we proclaim, one in which even the dead know new life in Christ, the resurrected one. May you too know this resurrected life. May you too practice it through the many upside-down works of justice and grace at St. Paul's and in the community. 
May you find your family to be friends, your vacant lot to transform. And make sure they are close to home so that they will remain close to your heart. Keep the poor, the hungry, the tearful, the persecuted close to you. And you will know Jesus' glorious blessings too. and for the world. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. 
Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you. We pray for Michael, our presiding bishop, Catherine, our assisting bishop, Susan, our bishop-elect, and for all bishops, priests, and deacons. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. Have compassion on those without a home and all who suffer from any grief or trouble. They may be delivered from their distress. Give to the departed eternal rest. We pray for Melinda Osley, Mark Asher, Daniel Ferry, Sam Jones, Jan Goostry. Elias Oberto, Jean Littler, and for those we now name. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. We pray for James McLeod, Christy Fleming, Fran Young, David Gibbs, Andrew Green, Gillian Turgeon, Tacey Cook, Kay Porter, Kevin Dennis, Faith DeHart, Rose Ramirez, Bob Osley and family, Sophia and Ronnie Almond, William and Krista Murray, Mari Bickford, Ellie Asher and family, Carmen Bates, Ronnie and Sophia Almond, Beth Beal, Nathan, and Alejandra, Alejandra Beard. Harvey DeVore and family. Ken and Diane Brown. Victoria Modic. Christian Miranda. Vanessa Albert. Brad Lovelace. For the leadership of the United Methodist Church as they meet to consider the full inclusion of LGBTQ people and those we now name. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life, especially for those who offer the ministry of hospitality our docents, ushers, greeters, and sextants, for the humanitarian work of the most venerable order of the Hospital of St. John of Jerusalem, providing health care and first responder services in over 40 nations around the world. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you. And
all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Good morning. My name is Penny Bridges. I serve as the Dean of St. Paul's Cathedral, and it's my joy to welcome you this morning, whoever you are and wherever you find yourself in the journey of life, of faith and life. Please know that you are most welcome to participate in all that we do at St. Paul's. God's table is open to everyone, and at communion time, as you come forward, if you would like to receive the sacrament, just put your hands together, one on top of the other. If you prefer to receive a blessing, cross your hands at your shoulders. And if you require a gluten-free wafer, they will be available over here by the healing station. A special welcome to our visitors today. Um, I, there are several ways that uh, we hope to make you welcome. One is our table, the greeter's table, right outside the door. Um, you can stop there after the service and tell us a little about yourself. Um, there, is, there are cards in the pews for newcomers, so that if you're too shy to speak to someone at the table, you can just fill out a card and put it in the offering plate. And today we're starting a new thing. We are still starting that today, aren't we? I see no, no shakings of heads. Um, for newcomers, a short coffee um, welcome um, program, 15, 10 to 15 minutes, immediately following the service, um, invite you to grab a cup of coffee in the courtyard and co go downstairs, across the courtyard and downstairs and around to the right to our parlor, which is underneath our great hall, um, and, uh, and learn a little bit about St. Paul's and meet a couple of people. And then we'll release you after about 15 minutes to come back and, and, uh, and, and mingle with everyone. But we're trying this out with slightly different um, introduction each week, one week um, a quick campus tour, another week talk about um, the opportunities for ministry, that kind of thing. So come if you're new, come if you're not new, and, and learn something. Um, we, we look forward to trying this ministry out. If you are celebrating a birthday or an anniversary this week, I invite you to stand as I say a prayer for you. Okay, let us pray. Watch over your children, O Lord, as their days increase. Bless and guide them wherever they may be. Strengthen them when they stand. Comfort them when discouraged or sorrowful. Raise them up if they fall. And in their hearts may your peace, which passes understanding, abide all the days of their life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Many happy returns to you all. It's a great joy to welcome back our own Colin Matthewson as our preacher today. Thank you for being with us. And it's really quite miraculous what's going on at St. Luke's under the leadership of Colin and Laurel. We're very proud. We're proud parents, having raised them up in the priesthood. Um, I also want to thank Leah Goodwin and Dr. Young for, um, for being with us today and offering the readings. Thank you for, for helping us celebrate Black History Month. Yeah.
we continue that celebration next week um, following Evensong um, in the in place of a sort of sermon, we will be watching the movie Hidden Figures, um, and you really must see it if you haven't, um, and having a, a conversation about it. And uh, also next week, our Peace and Justice Committee will be talking about the principles of peace and justice that we have uh, formulated um, and that chapter has adopted. Um, so come to the forum, nine o'clock next week, and learn more about that. Uh, this evening is the uh, annual Evensong of the Order of St. John of Jerusalem. You heard us um, pray for them and for the work that they do. And we need volunteers for Ashes to Go on March 6th, um, so please sign up. Um, there is information in your Cathedral Life leaflet behind the hymns, um, and you can find details of many of our activities. If you were listening closely in the prayers, you heard that we prayed for the repose of the soul of Melinda Osley. She was uh, the wife of our facilities manager, Bob Osley, very much beloved, uh, active choir member and lector. She was the voice of the cathedral. If you called into the cathedral and got the voice mail greeting, that was Melinda. Um, and she died late last night after several years of a very courageous battle with cancer. We don't yet know when the service will be. There will be a celebration of her life, of course, so stay tuned and um, Please pray for Bob, for his family, for the cathedral staff, and for the choir. Um, we are all hurting today. Please stand as you're able. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God.
be with you. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Saviour and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ and bring us to that heavenly country where with the blessed Virgin Mary, blessed Paul and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, 
and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Saviour Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Amen. Father, This is the table not of the church, but of Jesus Christ. It is made ready for those who love him and who want to love him more. So come, you who have much faith and you who have little, you who have been here often and you who have not been for a long time or ever before, you who have tried to follow and you who have failed, come not because the church invites you. It is Christ and he invites you to meet him here, the gifts of God for the people of God.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Christ. share with us in the communion of Christ's body and blood. We who are many are one body, because we all share one bread, one cup. The peace of God that passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of Christ Jesus and of God Jesus' Father, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs>